Hey everyone, this is Mike with the 30A Company, and we are coming to you today from Sowall House. Sowall House is a very special studio. Dave King has created something really wonderful for the 30A community, and he's always helping promote charities like the one, the special one that we're going to get to talk about today. I have the honor of being here with two friends, uh, both of which uh, know a lot about charity, including Sean Couch and Eric Zales. Uh, these guys are the co-founders of a project um, called the Paper Bear. And today we're going to learn all about not only what the Paper Bear is as a project, but we're also going to learn about some of the most important locals that we have in our community, um, namely the namesake of this film and project. So I want to take a moment to welcome Sean. Welcome, Eric. Thank you guys for coming to Sowall House and joining the podcast today. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for having us. So um, you guys uh, co-founded this uh, project, and and I know it's a near and dear to both of your hearts. I suspect that um, I kind of know how Eric's got involved. Eric's, I know you grew up here. You've been here since the 70s, and you've, you've been a part of the fabric of this community for a very long time. And Sean, I know that you work with a ton of charities, um, not just locally, but globally. Um, tell me briefly, um, what is the paper bear? You know, just in, in your own words, what is the paper bear? Um, and then I want to dig into, you know, some of the work that you guys have been doing over the past few years. Um, so the paper bear is a, a project that's actually grown into something something a lot bigger than it started. Um, originally, I've always had an idea. I, I do film, and I tend to do most of my film work out of the state of Florida. I use use my production company as a way to travel and, and be away from here. Um, so the paper bear originally was a film project I had in the back of my mind for about 10 years that was going to be done, um, really highlighting the biodiversity in the panhandle of Florida. And, um, right before COVID hit, I met Sean and he and I started discussing the idea and the potential of doing the project. And when it started, it was, it was more of a kind of documentary style, planet earth, you know, blue planet type type film. And it very quickly grew into what it is today, which is going to be a feature film. Um, and now it is its own nonprofit. And we're working with other organizations to to build something much bigger than just a film, an actual movement that goes above and beyond and, and has its own legs and will carry itself you know, here into the future. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize the Northwest Florida, you know, what, what some people call the panhandle is one of the five most biodiverse areas in the country. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. And, and of the five, it's one of the most biodiverse. Um, so, so biodiversity is becoming the hot topic with the world, you know, the global stage right now, the UN, they're talking about it extensively and, and putting in millions of dollars to study the biodiversity of the planet as it's um, quickly becoming probably the most important thing that we're going to need to, to combat climate change and still be able to live in a comfortable environment. Um, so even the UN went around globally in the last, I think it was the last five years, and they just released their study. And so the panhandle of Florida in their study, they also include um, Texas, Louisiana, and a little bit up the East Coast. We're the 36th most biologically uh, diverse place on the planet. So not only in the North America, but also on the planet. And that's incredible because I think that most people who have visited these, I mean, everybody knows we have the best beaches in the world, certainly among the best beaches in the world, but I don't think they, they stop to, to think about, they don't stop to think about what's right across scenic highway 30A north of them and what's north of Choctahatchee Bay. And, you know, I think when you really speak with authorities and experts, um, it's pretty astounding uh, not only the level of biodiversity that we have, but a lot of people are flabbergasted, and, and it and it blows me away as you know a guy who's been dealing with a large 30A fan base for a long time. It blows me away that people are still shocked. I mean, they're shocked to know that there are bears even in our community. Like that just blows people away. Why is that? Do you think it's it's 100 percent the history of the Panhandle. Um, 
so right at the end of the Civil War, um, well, let's take it back to the Civil War. During the Civil War, Lincoln passed what's called the Homestead Act. So everybody talks about homesteading their home today. That all originated from this act that he passed, I believe, in 1865, somewhere in there. Um, so basically what the Homestead Act said was if you paid a small fee and agreed to take care of a parcel of land, they would give you it was something like 160 acres of land. And so what happened when the Civil War ended, the South was decimated. The economy of the South was decimated. So you have the roads or bridges are destroyed, the towns are destroyed, and the entire um, economy of the South was really driven by the, the um, slavery in the larger communities. Um, a lot of the smaller communities didn't have slavery. And believe it or not, in Florida, a lot of it, it was, I believe, the largest state of free, free black people in the country at the time, especially over near Jacksonville. You know, you had massive uh, populations of um African Americans coexisting with the Native Americans, and many of them co-populated, and that's where you get a lot of the um, the Indian tribes today that still exist that are that are more um, dark skinned. Um, so Florida was already a very unique place, but we also had some of the most amazing forests in the country. And what happened was when the when the Civil War ended, the economy was decimated. Well any plantation owner immediately lost their free workforce. So many of them could no longer support, you know, keeping up the plantation. So you had this massive influx of uh, timber speculators and timber companies that came down out of the Northeast and started moving into the panhandle and, and just scooping up these homesteads. And instead of doing what the act was intended of, you know, taking care of the land, many of them just clear cut the land. And you know, and back then, taking care of the land didn't mean taking care of the forest. It meant turning the land into something that was useful. So a lot of it was, you know, filling, filling in swamps and turning it into farmland. The mindset on that sort of thing didn't really change until, I'd say, the 90s, where they started really understanding the importance of the, the wetlands and the swamps. But, you know, the fascinating thing about that is, is such an influx of people moved into the area, they completely wiped the panhandle out. I mean, they completely clear cut the panhandle of Florida. So, you know, by, by 1954, the Department of the Interior declared the entire panhandle of Florida an endangered ecosystem. And so when you, when you start with that and you've completely wiped out the biodiversity, um, you know, visually, and then you start recreating these communities, that, that logging continued up into the 90s. And so we have people that come down and they see our beaches, but many of these ecosystems are just now starting to get back on their feet and starting to reach a place of healthiness. So I think it's it's not a necessarily a place of ignorance for so many people. It's it's just they don't see it and it's hard to okay. know. It's like when you go to the redwood forest, you know, they, so many of the redwoods have been wiped out. But once you walk in a redwood forest, you're like, this is this is thousands of years old. This is magical. No, it's interesting, too, when you're driving, you know, say on you know, I 10 say to Jacksonville and, you know, you look out the, the window and you see all of the rows uh, of trees. It, it, it really does become very apparent very quickly. Oh, this was a crop. I mean, this yes. was like corn. Uh, all of the pine trees were planted in rows and they would come back 20 years later or whatever it was. And, um, and then regrow, pl replant and regrow. And that was just the way it was. So the black bear though, some hackle navigated all right somehow yes. survived this decimation of its habitat um and the the paper bear is a story that you guys are now putting to film and to animation which we'll talk about in a minute so it's a what kind of a coming of age story or something uh, kind of tell me a, just a high level um high level synopsis of the paper bear as a story I'm going to start and then just hand it off to Sean. Um, so everything I just said, it, it's important to, to, you know, as filmmaker, you say, how do you tell that story without it going dark? How do you tell that story without it being too heavy? How do you tell that story in a, in a way that's digestible for all age groups, all worldviews? And that's kind of how the paper bear came into being. Um, and I'll, I'll let Sean talk more about it, especially with the animation. Yeah, so sorry, I could sit and listen to Eric talk about this all day. <laughs> he, has, he has the bravado for it too. Um, but no, so yeah, we, Eric's and I met, we, it started off as a, a documentary film and we really kind of just started running and gunning and, and filming all of the beautiful natural scenery that's here. And it was actually in the 
height of the pandemic. So there was no one here. And you had these amazing scenic shots that we could capture, which was kind of really a once in a lifetime opportunity. So we really took that and um, we really didn't have any screenplay or a script, which typically is what you'd want to have before you start filming. Um, so we, so we, we did it backwards. Um, kind of, we needed to kind of seize the opportunity to get out there and start filming. And while Eric's was out, you know, neck deep in whatever <laughs> jungle habitat he was in capturing these amazing footage, um, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about our screenplay and our script and our story. And we kind of got back together and, and basically said that we need to do something that is different. That's not just your typical documentary because the problem with I see or that we see with documentaries is they're, they're amazing. And anybody can listen to, you know, Sir David Altunian um, speak about these beautiful places and, and things that are going on in our world. But what do you do afterwards? You know, they usually you, they're, they're a one-off watch and they're amazing and they can be inspiring, but they also could be very uh, daunting and overwhelming. And so that was really something that helped start the screenplay and the script. And we realized that we wanted to create more of a featured film that was entertaining, that was educational, that people would want to rewatch and that um, could maybe do something similar for the area that what the Truman Show did for this area and tourism maybe flip it on its head and do this for conservation and preservation of the area. And, and the kind of the difference between Eric's and I, when we talk about it, Eric's being the director that he is, he thinks of this as a film. I see this more as a charitable movement, as a conservation movement. And this film is one of many. And I kind of like to think of this out five to 10 years and how we can continue building on this um, and strategizing on that. So every decision that we make really has had that in mind of thinking that far ahead. Um, so the story is a, a coming of age father and son um, odyssey or adventure through the wilderness of the Florida panhandle as a father takes his son to essentially uh, track down and the black bear population. And through this journey, the father is educating his son on all of these things. And it's, it's a, there's going to be a lot of humor and sarcasm and entertainment because you, and we draw a lot of parallels to what, who we are as today and, and how we find ourselves to be distracted. So you have a teenage boy who is enamored with his phone and with his friends and maybe not being present. So he's basically forced to go on this, I wouldn't say forced, but goes on this journey with his dad and really is enlightened. And, and as you watch this journey unfold, um, really just becomes more uh, present and with the surrounding that he's in and, and, and takes this journey with his dad that I think is just going to really kind of um, blow audiences away. And you mentioned uh, and you touched on briefly that you felt it's important this type of topic can be very heavy. It can be depressing. And it can also yes. come across, if you don't do it right, it can come across as preachy, right? Yes, and, you know, exactly. let's admit it. When people come to the beach, man, it went under a lot of pressure, you know, and they've saved up their vacation dollars. They have waited maybe three, four or more years to come down here with their kids. And they've got five days and they're going to make the best of it. The last thing, you know, that perhaps they're even thinking about is conservation or the ecology or or, right. or even stepping off the beach to explore the forest as an alternative to the beach. But I think that when you talk about a movement, I mean, you know, really you're talking about, um, you know, giving people a reason to be curious and, and not to be depressed or to feel bad, but instead to be actively interested in, in it. Right. And it, so it sounds like animation, you know, so the, I gather that the film is part uh, live action and part animation. And based on, we're going to include the link to the, the teasers that you guys have been putting out there. Animation's just stunning. And it, and I tell yeah. you what, it's not oh, only just you. stunning animation and it's, I mean, instantly it's going to evoke nostalgic memories of Disney films mm -hmm. and stuff, of course. And, and I know you've got people working with you from the Disney world. So I want to hear about that. But, you know, to me, it really is stunning to see our community 
Like, I mean, you can see mm-hmm. things you recognize. You can see plants you recognize. You can see vistas you recognize. You see a bear on the beach that it's like, wow, these are things that I know happen, but now I really get to see it in a way that I've never seen it before. So do please tell us a little bit about the animation and the team you've assembled to kind of bring that and why you feel like that's an important part of this story. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up about recognizing plants and stuff in the animation. So the animation team is out of Bulgaria. Um, and part of that is just the sheer cost of doing the old school hand draw on Disney style animation. Um, we looked to do it in the States first, but it's just, it wasn't feasible. And it's the reason Disney doesn't do it anymore. It's just so incredibly expensive to do. Um, but in doing that, you know, we're working with this team in Bulgaria and we were taking, we would take calls every morning for sometimes three hours and they're literally drawing in real time in front of us. And then once we get them on a, a certain track, we'd, we'd get off the call and they'd continue throughout the day. So for me, I'm like, that, that's not right. That little grass you just drew is not right. That's yeah, not Eric's, what it looks like. Eric's and they're like, well, it doesn't matter. Detail. I'm like, no, it matters. Trust me. The people that live here are going to recognize it instantly. And they're going to say that's not here. And so once we got that mindset with the crew and everybody that this is, this is about the biodiversity and an important part of that is, you know, when you, when you Disney eyes <laughs> an area, if you're, if you're highlighting the area as one of the characters in the film, you got to get it right. And you got to present it right. And you got to show people are going to say, that's a long leaf pine tree. I recognize that. I see that every day when I'm on my walks. Well, that's it's, what makes Disney so successful when they make an animated film, they do a tremendous amount of research yeah. to do that. And they, they send their animators out into these places and they sketch and they do things. I mean, you should have seen the documents and imagery that Eric's gave this team. It was amazing to watch. I was just going to say they would draw something and I'd be like, no, 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 there's no rocks in Florida. <laughs> there's no rock structures. We we need to take that out of there. Well, the, well they Especially fell into the same. the story was written. Well, they fell into the same trap as um, most people think when you think about a bear. I remember one of the first imagery they, they did of a bear. It was, you know, it was like a kind of typical scary grizzly, you know, these menacing claws and like, it just looked like it would just terrify a, a child. And we're like, no, that's, we just rein it in. And I mean, it was really, you know, a, a process, but we finally got there. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about people's irrational fears. And, you know, and it, it just, it just pains me greatly. Uh, and again, I'm, I, have been involved with the 38 company now for, I guess, going on 17 years. And, you know, so I've interacted a lot with fans over the years and it's still stunning to me that you just mentioned a shark or Mm. that, you know, somebody shares a clip of a shark being sighted. I've I've had questions like, no kidding. It'll be like July and I'll get a question on Facebook, like have the sharks left Florida? I'm like, yes, ma'am. There are no sharks in Florida. I mean, it's like, I don't know what people are thinking, but I mean, obviously Jaws did a tremendous disservice uh, unintentionally, but you know, this, this animal that really, if you actually look at the statistics, I think since 1882, when they first began keeping these records in the entire state of Florida. Now you think about Jacksonville, you think about Key West, you think about Miami, you think about Fort Lauderdale, you think about Tampa. I mean, you think about, you know, uh, Pensacola. Since that time, I think 13 people have died from shark attacks in the state of Florida in 140 years. You know, you are in more danger crossing 30A uh, unquestionably unquestionably than you, than you ever are. And anytime you've paddle boarded, you're going to see a shark. I mean, they're there. That's where they live. And the same, but, but bear are a little more reclusive. I think, you know, they're, they're, uh, they seem to, to be very private creatures. And so I'm hoping because you're starting to see this emergence as humans, as more development happens in our area, um, you're starting to see now this uh, budding of heads of of bears and humans. And unfortunately, human knee-jerk reaction is OMG. You know, it's like, uh, you know, my my ring cam picked up a bear digging through my garbage this morning and people go, oh, we got to, you know, and and again, don't get me wrong. We have to be safe. We have to make sure our children and our pets are safe. However, this is their, you know, this is their home. And we're the ones that continue to push into their home. So I guess my question to you is, you know, how do we change that perception? Um, and, and do we need to change that perception? And what can we do to help protect these animals and to give them the space they need to thrive, um, but 
while also being um, ensuring that our children are safe, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's that's probably the most important question right now um, with with kind of what we're doing and how things are moving. And I, you know, for me, part of it is a complete misunderstanding of the Florida black bear, a complete misunderstanding of how the Florida black bear communicates its language, um, a complete misunderstanding of what it's doing and why it's doing it. Um, you know, for example, right now we have this war going on in Ukraine and I was looking at some images the other day and I see this mother standing with her daughter on the side of the road and she's looking at her home, which has completely been devastated. And it's like, as a human, you look at that and it, you, you empathize instantly and you're like, okay, we can think about that and we can say this woman has to now figure out not only where to sleep at night, she has to figure out where she's going to get her food. She has to figure out all these things. It's no different for the bears. When we build a community here and we come in and we clear cut, you're literally taking the grocery store that that bear uses every day and completely wiping it out in the space of 24 hours or you know three days. So a lot of times when these bears start showing up in our neighborhoods and stuff, it's part of it is them saying, OK, I've got to quickly figure out a new place to find food because the place I always went to now is not there. Um, and then in doing that, they are communicating with us, but we're not understanding the communication. And so for me in this project, you know, we've part of this film is not like you said, not being heavy and not being educational, but part of it is being as true to the, the topic as humanly possible. So a big part of that was going out and living with black bears. So for two years, I went out and lived with black bears and learned how to speak their language and learn how to interact with them. And as I learned their language, what I quickly realized was we are just misunderstanding these animals immensely. Um, the things that we, we take as aggression are not aggression. They're actually communicating with us. So a perfect example, a woman, I, we were talking, I think two days ago, and this woman pulls out a video in watercolor and she shows this mama bear coming out of the woods with her cub and she's in her house and the mama bear lunges up on the porch and does what's called a false charge. And she's like, look how aggressive this bear is. And I said, no, that's actually not aggression. That's communication. I do that to them out in the woods. I charge them and stamp my feet. And what I'm telling them is this is my comfort zone. Don't, don't cross this because I'm here with my child. Um, so I think part of it is just learning to learn their language and respect their space. And, you know, when, when these bears start coming into our communities, it, that's not an end all be all. It's they're coming in there for several reasons. One, either they're just coming through because their their habitat has been disturbed, and they're in like anybody. You're you're looking for a new way to e exist because your existence has been so drastically changed so quickly. And two, it could be smells, or you're not covering your garbage can. So you know, black the Florida black bears specifically are very opportunistic. You know, they're, if if they have the choice to go eat a little bit of a Barago out of your trash can, as a you know, compared to going and picking fifty thousand berries in a day, they're going to go to Barago's. You know, they're going to go to your house <laughs> and get get the leftover shrimp and grits. I I would do the same thing. Um, so once you understand that and you understand that this isn't an end all be all, you know, the, the thing that kills me is this word nuisance starts popping up and I'm like, well, who's the nuisance? You know, this, if you change the story by, you know, figuring out a way to, to cover your can or, or make your can where it can't be accessed within a week, those barrels will be gone and they won't be coming back. And I think one thing that's happened too is we have cameras on everything now. It's not that all of a sudden we have more bears coming sure. around our house at night that, you know, it used to be, we just didn't know they were coming around our house at night. They were coming on your porches and they were looking in your windows for a very long time. And another thing, you know, and this is a, a fault of my industry. A lot of people fear the sharks and the bears because we've taught them to fear the sharks and the bears. Just like you said, we have shark week, we have bear week, and it's not showing how, beautiful these creatures often are, you know, that's not the storyline we, we perpetuate on, on a lot of these channels. It's more, we got to get viewers watching. So what do we do? We make it scary and we make it, you know, suspenseful and then we watch it. Exactly. But then people walk away and go, wow, bears are scary and sharks are scary. You know, it's an interesting point. I've never thought about it from the bear perspective, but shark perspective, I a hundred percent know that just from firsthand experience. It's like, okay, the sharks are always there. I mean, like one out of three times you paddleboard, you're going to see, one. you know, right. it's just the way it is. And, but cameras now are everywhere. Everybody's got a GoPro, they mm -hmm. got selfie sticks, they got whatever. So we're, we, we are now conditioned, 
you know, to believe that there's an increase in frequency, but it's actually no, it's just that I would never have known about that shark sighting in Dude Allen um, unless the shared it on social. I, I just, I wouldn't have known that person right. and therefore I never would have encountered yeah. that video. And now that, like you say, we've got motion detectors on our doorbells for crying out loud and, and you know, we've got uh, cameras all over our house. So we're suddenly capturing things that probably always happened. Yes, um, ignorance is now, bliss. And, and that's right. But now it gets, it gets shared, you know, and, and again, I think that you're right that that, that the term nuisance is, is not a good term. And, and hopefully that's something that we can, as, as educators, um, we do everything we can. We will share a video on 30A of a shark sighting, but we always do it in conjunction with a link to here's things you didn't know about sharks. Like here, right. like, don't be afraid. Here's what you need to know. You know, it's, I think that the same needs to be done with the bears. Like people want to see them, you know, like to me, it's so amazing that I, I sometimes, uh, even local authorities, shall we say, don't want to talk about sharks. And I'm like, you know, to me, it's like, if I go to Yellowstone, I want to see a bear. Right. I want to see a moose. You know, if I go to the right. beach, I want to see these. I want to, now I want to do it responsibly. And I want to, but I want to be educated. And, and I want to, to, to be able to witness incredible things, you know, as they really happen in nature. So I think there's an opportunity for us to, with your film to get ahead of this, as opposed to the other way where the damage is done with a, a 70s horror flick. You know, I think there's an opportunity to get in front of this and, and to tell the bear's story in the right way. Let me ask you a question. You guys have referred to bear uh in especially in our um part of the world as an umbrella species and then an umbrella species actually has a trickle down effect to other species what do you mean by umbrella species well before we answer that question i kind of want to add one thing but we were just talking about with the bears um sure i think a really important part and kind of going back to the animation because we kind of touched on it is all about perception and empathy and that's one of the reasons why we're doing the animation part we're doing animation in the film because it's going to give people a unique perspective that you couldn't give them any other way. So people are really going to see their environment, their lifestyle in a way that no one's ever seen before. And that's going to allow you to relate. It's going to find parallels between us and them. And it's going to create characters that we're really passionate about. And it takes that same kind of philosophy and winning formula that Disney does where they create these characters. And that was one of Walt Disney's favorite things to do. And that's why he was one of the, you know, most all time ways well, the nominated or winning Oscar winner is because of all of his wildlife documentaries. And he believed that them as themselves documenting them as themselves had the characters and the stories already built in. And he, he captured that very well. So I think, you know, that's the idea with the animation part is that we're really going to see a whole new perspective, a whole new world and people are really going to find a way to relate more to these creatures. And I think that's going to really help with this movement. And um, I think that's just a really important reason why. And I, for myself, I have four kids. So I, I specifically, so when Eric and I wrote the screenplay, he did the live action part and I did the animation part. I have four small kids. I wanted to find something that I knew that they could relate to. I spent a lot of time during the pandemic sitting in front of the television, watching Kung Fu Panda or whatever amazing <laughs> thing. But I kind of picked up on some really cool things that they did when writing those stories. And that's kind of a lot of those elements I put into that specific part and um, complementary to the live action. So I think that's just something that I think people need to understand that they'll see. And. And by the way, you know, for we, we talked a little bit about the animation and, you know, Eric, you mentioned living with bears for two years. And, and for anyone who doesn't understand what you mean, I was, you know, honored and privied enough to some of your uh, video and, and photography. I mean, we're talking about bears literally nudging up against you yep. when, you, when you're holding <laughs> your camera on the yep. ground and they're, and they're, you know, that close. So you, you really were in their work for, yeah. for days, um, hours. Yeah. Anywhere from, uh, <laughs> you know, some days, eight hours, some day, 14 hours. Uh, people ask if I slept with them and no, because, you know, primarily the, the bear is a lot of them. We didn't know where he was. He didn't, he didn't tell us. I was like, if something yeah, happened to you, anybody. Eric, so I was like, you need to give us like a GPS cord. And he's like, I'm fine guys. I'm fine. Well, on my, you know, Jen one night 
I, I, it was the one day I was interacting with a bear that's about 600 pounds. And I said, if something's going to go wrong, it's going to be tomorrow. So I just want you to know that. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, nothing's going to happen, but if, if it was going to happen, it's going to be tomorrow. Um, I'm going to go out before sunrise and I haven't interacted with this bear yet. Um, I think it's a male. I know it's about 600 pounds. So if it's going to go wrong, it's going to be tomorrow. So just know that. And so she immediately said, well, I need to know where you are. And this is after a year and a half of you know being out there. <laughs> this is what I love about Jen. She's just like, he's going to do what he's going to do. And I, you know, I'm not going to stop it. So um, so I said, okay, I'll give you a GPS coordinate. And so once I got out to where I was, it's it's crazy because it's it's so close to 30A, but it's remote enough that when I went to do the GPS coordinate, it kept sending a, a, a coordinate for Brago, the restaurant. And so finally, <laughs> I just texted her and I said, I, I I I can't explain to you how to get here, but it's not it's not the restaurant. So. Can I ask a question? Is Barago sure. sponsoring this film? Because uh, <laughs> no, I keep, it's what's a funny. Lot of plugs. <laughs> what's funny? The reason I keep bringing up, bringing up Barago is we love, and I talk to the guys, uh, good friends with the guys that run the restaurant, and we sure. are um, we've actually brought the restaurant into the animation, so we're animating. Oh, that's the, awesome. The, the structure Very is cool. part of the story. Well, but it's also because of the history. It's like one of the longer structures. One of the older buildings. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, back to the topic of umbrella species. Uh, for, for the benefit of the audience, you have a premise, or, and maybe it's not your premise, but there is an argument that protecting the black bear is more than just protecting the black bear. And so yes. so ex- please elaborate on that a little bit. So, so the concept of umbrella species was something that came about, I'm trying to think of when they started using that term. It's basically... It's like you said, doing the educational component can always be a challenge and you can put people to sleep. And so, you know, in the scientific community, they started saying, how can we protect a larger area or how can we protect more species? And so they started to learn that if you educate on what's called an umbrella species, which is a species that travels through multiple ecosystems or relies on uh, many different types of plants and animals for its survival. If you can get people to focus on that one species, like an umbrella, you know, like a cascading effect, it's going to protect all the species under it. So when you look at the black bear, you know, it travels the home range for a female usually is in the, you know, 10 to 15 square mile and the males will travel up to a hundred square miles. And a lot of that's because of genetics and, you know, the female just needs to be where she is to eat, whereas the male's looking for mates and, and for food. So when you, if you can get people to fall in love with a, a black bear and want to protect the black bear by default, you're, def, you're protecting every ecosystem that it needs to survive and all the animals that live in those ecosystems. So that's why it's called an umbrella species. So right. when you look at Biophilia Center and Naguzi up north, they talk a lot about the gopher tortoise, um, which was endangered. Protecting the gopher tortoise, you're protecting the Florida fox, you're protecting the indigo snake, which is, in, I mean, you're protecting just a plethora of animals and plants because in order to protect that one species, it, it covers all these others like an umbrella. Um, in my time in living with the bears, I personally believe the Florida black bear is probably one of the most important animals, if not the most important animal we have in the panhandle. And the reason for that is as we're bringing these forests and wild spaces back for our own benefit and for our own future, it's probably one of the most prolific animals in terms of spreading food, food sources for all the other animals. Each bear eats upwards of 30,000 berries, nuts, and seeds a day, and then passes that. And I, and I documented this, you know, I can show bear scat. And then a month later, I can show you, you know, two live oak trees growing out of it from the acorns they were eating. And so in doing the the research and doing the analysis on the data, I talked to Matt up at Nagusi and I'm like, how much does it cost you to, to reforest one acre of land and you're looking at you know a couple years tens of thousands of dollars or you can bring in a a healthy population of black bears you worry about planting the trees and if those bears are close to that area they're going to reforest that area for you and they're going to bring in all the other animals so for me when i'm out there the places that have the most dense um, animal populations is where the black bears are it's where all the food is it's where all the uh, water is so umbrella species is is really uh, it's just really a way of helping people understand, you know, it packages it in a way that makes it easy for a, a child to understand the importance of protecting one species and how it protects all species under them. I don't know how, you know, prolific it is 
in, in, in Florida, but I know in some parts of the world, you know, there's talk about population control, especially as it comes to bears uh, of different varieties. Um, tell me your thoughts after having not only spent time with the bears, but understanding much more about how we interact with them here in the Panhandle. What do you believe is the right approach? I mean, you know, because development, unfortunately, is is a is a reality that is difficult to stop. Um, that said, you know, as good stewards of this land and 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 stewards of you know, hopefully, a place that our children and grandchildren um, will get to to live and experience in similar ways that we do. What do we do as human beings? Um, you know, what is the approach that we should be taking, in your opinion, um, in in terms of how do we? Uh, manage this relationship between bears and humans? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. And that actually, I think one thing that I've always loved about, you know, your organization and what you guys do is I feel like you, you, you're not, you don't shy away from the hard questions. You don't shy away from, we're, we're a growing community and we have growing pains. You know, I've been here since 78 and I'm not anti-development. This project isn't anti-development. It's more, how do you start the conversation and how do we come to an understanding and a, and a realization of what do we want? And if that's what we want, how do we get there? Because I, you know, the big thing I see now is people moving into the area, building a home, and then they fall in love with the area. And it's exactly what you said, Mike, we shouldn't be hiding this some stuff from people. That's the worst thing we could do. We should be telling everybody there's bears here and we should be telling everybody you, you want to love these bears. We should the be more celebrating. We, don't t- we should celebrate it a hundred percent. You know, the more we s- don't talk about sharks, the more people are going to fear them. The more we talk about them, all of a sudden they, you know, the fear goes away and then you just embrace them as part of your community. So the, the two things that I'm seeing butting heads right now is we have a lot of people who move here, love the area, fall in love with it, and then immediately want to protect it. And then we have a lot of people who come into the area and it's an investment. They don't come here. They're just buying that rental house so they can make money off of it all year. And that's that's the challenge because those are the people that aren't invested in the nature of the area. They're just invested in how do I make my money off of spring break and summer. And so you have the people that are living here year round and it's, you know, the conversation has to to shift to one of, okay, from an economic standpoint, is this smart economics or bad economics? If we totally wipe out, you know, the thing that makes us world class, are we doing a smart economic thing for the long run? Or are we doing a very dumb economic thing? And so, you know, in terms of the black bear, Black bears self-regulate. It's pretty amazing. And when I learned this, I was pretty blown away. The female, they they mate around June, July. And the female, she'll may, let's say she has three eggs. And let's say those three eggs get um, impregnated. She'll hold those three eggs through the entire summer. She continues to eat. And at the end of the summer, um, August, September, if she's forged enough and has enough food to support three babies, those eggs will drop and she'll get pregnant with three babies. If she's only gotten enough food to support one baby, one egg will drop, two will abort, and she'll have one baby. So they're a self-regulating species. And so a lot of times when we're talking about um, population control, what's happened is we've come in and we've wiped out some of their population. And just like the analogy I gave about Ukraine, all of a sudden there's a shift in what's happening in the bear world. So all of a sudden our knee-jerk reaction is, well, I'm seeing a lot more bears and there's more population. We need to do something about this. When the reality is you give it one, two years, it's going to self-regulate. You know, a lot of the adult bears are going to be eating up a lot of the food. If it's not there, the females aren't going to have as many cubs. And to me, the important thing about the black bear population is in the amount of time you can take a deer population and increase it by 1,400, you only get about 60 to 80 black bears. So when you're talking about regulating a population, it's not like deer will just mate and, and you know, deer rabbits will just have babies regardless of whether there's food. Sure. And you start having these issues of, you know, poor health and malnutrition because there's not enough, you know, they're overpopulating the area. Bears, bears self-regulate their population. And that's another thing that's never discussed or, or understood. But I think that's an important part you talked about is diet. Like the, when they start dumpster diving and when they start mm-hmm. eating into our trash, that's when it becomes more of a problem, right? It's really more, you see more of them. Yeah, absolutely. So, so perhaps the hope is that we get to a place where the community loves having, you know, are these neighbors because they're good because people want to, to, to come to a place where they feel like nature is, is, is present. 
and and maybe we just get smarter about how to secure food, how to secure right. our homes, Absolutely. how to make sure you know that live that, in that harmony. Our property. That that's right, and and so I, hopefully that's something that will come out of this um, amazing, extraordinary project that you guys are working on. When do you expect? Uh, and I know everything's a moving target, but at this moment in time, you know what are you targeting for a release date on the the feature length film? Million dollar question. <laughs> we, you know, as the as the executive producers, we're telling the whole team end of twenty twenty three, end of twenty twenty three. Um, it's possible if all the stars align and everything comes together, and we get it, we get all the final funding we need to finish the animation component. It's possible to release, you know, and, and submit to like Sundance at the end of this year. Um, our initial release is going to be a film festival. So part of it's dictated by that. And we're going for the larger film festivals just so we can do the national distribution. So, you know, it could be the beginning of next year, 2024. Um, in terms of finishing the live action filming, we have the entire crew showing up April 15th and we'll be done with that April, uh, May 7th. So uh, we, we have created an entire video village and the entire cast and crew are living in the same place for almost a month and working every day, all day to get this thing done. You need to tell them about the crew. Tell them about the crew. We've yeah, it's, uh, we've assembled a pretty amazing crew. Um, we had over a thousand men audition and over a thousand boys audition from all over the country for the two roles in the film. And we've narrowed it down. It's funny because we worked with, uh, I think, what was it, two or three different talent scouts? One of them was a national talent scout, you know, and so they deal with people all over the country. And then there's a, a group out of Atlanta called Houghton Talent, and we ended up using two of their actors because they were so good and worked so well together. Um, phenomenal actors. Uh, the young the young boy, he was in one of the Home Alone movies. He actually got cast for, they're going to do a remake of The Wonder Years, and he was cast as, as, you know, the young lead actor in that, but they didn't want him to get, his parents didn't want him to get, uh, stuck in a in a you know a five year, they wanted him to be able to do films and have more diversity in what he does. Um, and we know we were just talking to him. He he was just auditioning for Francis Ford Coppola, I guess, a month or two ago. And so I, I said, "How did that go?" And he in I guess I could be wrong on this, but I believe it was a role written for a young female character. But they it got it to the point where he made it to the final because they liked him so much. They were considering changing that. Don't don't uh, hold me to that. But I think that's what the story was. But anyway, he said he met with Francis. And when Francis told him he wasn't going to get the position, he, get, he gave him a two dollar bill. And he said, this is your lucky two dollar bill. This will bring good luck to you. And a week later, we called him and said, we're moving forward. And you're one of the leads in this role. And so for those and for those who don't know who Francis is, I would give some. Context. Oh, Francis Ford Coppola. He's just one of the greatest directors of American cinema. Um, some of his films are. Some of his films are all the uh, uh, Godfather films, um, Apocalypse Now. Uh, he started. In he hasn't made a movie cities. in years. Yeah. It's just like, a, yeah. So then the father is a, a, a man named Jason Berkey. He's also out of Atlanta. And it's funny because once we cast him, we were like, Sean and I are like texting each other every night. Did you see Jason? He was in that show on Netflix last night and he was in this commercial. He's <laughs> just so prolific. Um, he just loves, he's one of those actors that, Loves what he does so much. He doesn't wait for years for just the one role. He's just constantly acting and doing doing as many things as he can because he loves it. Reminds, it reminds me a lot of Christopher Walken. That was one thing about Christopher Walken. Everybody that knew him said until the day, you know, all the way up until today, he was always taking any role, just about any role, because he just loved what he did. And he didn't want to not be acting at any moment. I think, you know, it's something for us to all look forward to. But the great thing is, is you guys are, you guys have the website, which is the paperbear.org. And you guys are starting to tease with, with trailers and you're starting to, um, you know, provide behind the scenes uh, type stuff. Uh, I, I'm assuming more of that will be coming. How do people get involved? Obviously, there's a financial component to this that I'm sure for anyone who wants to get involved financially, I know you can go to the paperbear.org and donate. But what else would you like to see as this grassroots movement take shape and hopefully our community rallies around these super important members of our community, these these people who preceded us, the uh, not people, these animals that preceded us? Uh, what what can people do now to help you get this thing across the finish line? I think, you know, a, a one really important big thing, and it's something that people want to do is just follow us on the social media channels, because 
you know, that helps us when we go to the film festival and then you start negotiating with the Disney's and the Netflix. If we already have a really strong following on social media, it makes those negotiations so much easier and so much in our community's benefit. Um, so I can promise you, if you're following, you're going to be entertained. We're going to be showing behind the scenes of all the filming of a feature film in our area. And, and when we're filming, so many of these locations are now we're probably not going to show you some of the locations in the behind the scenes because we want you to go see the film. But we'll do some teasing. We'll do some teasing. We'll do some teasing. But it's very difficult to get to. So then the question is, how do you film in places like this? So it's going to be awesome to see uh, that the the DP is coming out of L.A. His name's Brad Richard, Brad Richard. And he grew up in uh, Fort Walton. He went to Choctaw. That's why he came on the project. He loves the area. He's been a um, cameraman in LA for 25 years. You know, he did a cam on Argo, which won the Oscar. He did a season of Dexter. He did a season of true blood, true blood. He did a full season of um, Friday night lights. And so he's coming to work on this film and he and I work daily and we're trying to figure out how the heck can we get some of these shots when you can't get a crane, you know, into this location that we can hardly get into. And so we, we've come up with this piece of equipment. It's called the anti-gravity cam. And he looks almost like a, a transformer with this thing. And he walks around and he can make the camera go four feet above his head and then drop down to the ground level. And it looks like a beautiful crane shot. And yet he's just, it's almost like, the, you know, an avatar, the new, right, the new avatar. Right. You see the guys walking around in these suits and they're fighting as a robot. It's, it, it's a little bit like that. So, you know, it's, it, I would say follow us. It's going to be very entertaining to watch and just spread the word. That's one of the most important things too. So that is something that anybody can do, guys. We're going to put links uh, to all the social channels here. And even if you don't have the money to donate, uh, we know the economy is is tight and tough at times. Uh, but if you have an opportunity to donate, please go to the paperbear.org and contribute. But if not, at the very least, go onto their Instagram page, go onto their Facebook page, all the other social channels they have. And let's, uh, my sincere hope is that not just as a geographic community, but that as a, as a community of people who love the, the 30A mindset and 30A lifestyle, uh, this is a real opportunity for our community, I think, to make us much more than a beach destination. You know, it really is. You touched on it earlier uh, from an economic standpoint. We're so blessed as a community that we were developed last um, right. because we had the opportunity of seeing this wave of development come. And, uh, and I'm not knocking any other community in Florida or elsewhere, but you know, once you've paved over that lake and to make a parking lot or once you've, you, you've torn down the forest to put up uh, water slides, you don't get that back. You know, so our biggest economic asset are our community, are our coastal dune lakes. It's Point Washington State Forest. It's five amazing state parks we have right in our backyard. It's Choctahatchee Bay. It's the river, Choctahatchee River. It is all of the woodland north in Freeport and Defuniac. It's our, it's Morrison Springs. All of these stunning assets that 90 percent of visitors don't even know about and i'm not suggesting everybody needs to take off and head into the woods what i am suggesting is that we have an opportunity to make ourselves the disney world of ecology right you know it's like i I always i hesitate to make that analogy sometimes because disney means different things to different people but if you think about the communities along 30a in some ways uh as the, the, the 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 resorts you know it's like okay you've got a theme here you've got a theme here you got up got it but the coastal dune lakes the rivers the dunes the 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 bay those are the rides those are the attractions you know we don't have to do anything you know except for at all cost protect those assets because we have them and no one else does Yep. And I, and I would say too, another thing we would love people to do is we're starting to give out stickers and t-shirts and things like that. We've, we put out stickers already for spring break across a few different businesses, and we're going to continue to do that. And one of the reasons when we were coming up with our branding, and when you'll see it, it's very specific, it's a paw mark. And my idea when we were doing that is that if you see any area that you love, take that sticker and, you know, use that as a symbol for anybody is kind of like for the initiated. You, you see that, you know what these people are about. They, they know about the paper bear. They're, they're stoked about this movement and they're going to do everything they can. So kind of creating a guerrilla marketing for people out there for the, that are passionate about this project and protecting it. And I, and I think what you just said, Mike, what's so powerful about that is it, if you love the beach, 
you better start loving what's north yeah, of the beach because connected. it's going to go away if you don't start, if we don't, you know, and I can tell you having been here since the early seventies that, you know, we used to go to Destin when there was nothing in Destin, like you said, nothing against Destin, but it's a completely different beach than yeah. it used to be. It used to look exactly like our beaches and the, you know, if we, if you don't pay attention to what's north of the beaches, it all feeds into it. And that's a big part of this film is understanding that, you know, one thing leads into another. And when you, when you look at things from an economic standpoint, Right now, our, our economics is the beach. And if, if that goes away, those economics will slowly start going away as well. Yep. Well, and I think we all yeah. owe a, a, a unrepayable debt of gratitude to the forefathers of our community who protected not only the five state parks, but some, you know, 15,000 acres in Point Washington State Forest. And, and you know, I think all told about 25,000 acres just on our little peninsula, um, which is absolutely a game changer and so thank you guys for documenting uh not many people take the time to go look at those places but those who do never forget it so i want to thank uh sean and eric's of uh, the paperbear.org the paper bear project uh coming to theaters and film festivals uh and and certainly no doubt we're going to have some screenings uh on 30a and we're going to be helping you guys tell your amazing story. So thank you for for sharing it with us today. I really, truly appreciate what you're doing. And I know that Absolutely. 20 years yeah, from you. now, the community is going to look back at this as something that is like, man, those guys really created a work of art that that perhaps changed the mindset of, of everybody who not only lives here, but all of the people who come to visit this special place. Thank yeah, you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. You know, one thing I'd like to leave in everybody's mind is we've talked about this whole idea of, of the fear factor. And, and like you said, when you're looking at sharks, the number of attacks, the Florida black bear is the closest thing in America that we have to a true teddy bear. They, you know, all the bears in every state and every population are very different. We have one of the shyest, um, most reclusive bears and only 5% of their diet is meat. And all of that is like, you know, grubs and lizards and frogs. So they have no desire to attack you. They have no desire to attack your dog. Um, so to keep that in mind, you know, if you're going in the woods, just, just remember the, if you could take one thing away from this podcast, it's if you come across a bear and you're thinking it's being aggressive, it's communicating with you and it's their communication can come across as aggressive, but they're not an aggressive animal. It's probably one of the most, uh, beautiful, timid bears that we have in all of North America. That's Absolutely. a great place to start. Uh, this adventure is is through education and uh you know thank you guys for doing your part to help share the story of a of a neighbor that can't share it by themselves so thank you guys and yeah, thank we you also guys. want to thank, thank so wall house for sharing stories yes. like this so wall house what an amazing um, space dave king has built something amazing in rosemary beach you can go to sowallhouse.com and he is always the first one to volunteer to help charities uh, to help young entrepreneurs. So uh, hats off to Dave King and the team at Sowall House uh, for bringing stories like this to you. Um, otherwise, that these stories might not get told. So thanks, Dave King. Thanks, Sowall House. Uh, thanks to Sean and Eric's. And uh, we cannot wait to see the film. And I want to encourage everyone to follow us on 30a.com and also in Beach Happy Magazine because Sean and Eric's have been uh, sharing some of their story in the magazine and will continue to do so, no doubt, through the, the launch of the film uh, as early as the end of the year, All right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that fair? But don't, but don't don't hold us to it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working <laughs> on it. No, that's all right. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank thank you again. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We appreciate you guys so much. Thank you.